How's it going, everyone? Welcome to this week's Q&A. So like any other week, if you want a chance to one of your questions being answered, make sure you drop a comment down below. And this week, it is the 100th episode. So we have answered uh, tons and tons and tons of questions. Now, some of them may have been repetitive slash a uh, slightly different but here we are nonetheless so 100 episodes and that is because of you guys you guys keep providing you know some feedback and questions which kind of keeps this thing going so i'd like to keep this going because i think a lot of people do benefit from this and a lot of channels out there don't answer you know specific questions to your guys uh concerns so i'd like to keep this going i think it's a great you know a feature of the the channel so again i'd like to keep this going and hopefully uh we could get to two maybe 300 400 episodes or you know whatever see where this kind of takes us so uh it is easter sunday today so if you celebrated uh, easter over the weekend uh, you know happy easter if not i hope you guys had a, a great weekend and whatnot the weekends for me at least go by quick, whether it be, you know, the kids' sports or activities or whatnot, or, you know, house projects or even uh, car projects or whatever. Uh, it does seem to go by fairly quickly, although I try to enjoy it as much as possible. Sunday's like my only off day to do whatever I want. And usually it's involved with the family and kids, which is great. And as my kids grow up, you know, I'll kind of get them involved with the car scene, which again, I think is great and a good bonding moment for all of us uh, as a family as a whole. So uh, with that being said, Let's go ahead and get started with the first question of the week, and it is six-speed uh, automatic transmission from Honda versus a 10-speed. Which one do I prefer? The pros and cons of each of them. So I'll go ahead and say that both of them could be very good transmissions. Now, the six-speed right off the bat is going to require more maintenance, even though it has uh, less uh, gears to shift through. And there's just, you know, a design flaw by them. Now, there is some updates and some torque converter changes that could be done with certain codes. Uh, warranty extension actually got um, extended to 10 years and I believe 150,000 miles by Thursday or Friday this week from eight years. And I don't even know the previous miles before, maybe 120, 130,000 miles. But if you get a P0741 code, uh, that's the uh, code that needed to uh, require a complete uh, transmission or excuse me a torque converter replacement right off the bat if you're having some juddering usually if it hasn't been done already there is a three times flush with a, a software update again if it hasn't been done already now on these transmissions i recommend religiously to my customers 15 to 20,000 miles. Usually by the time you get to 30,000 miles, it means the fluid is extremely dark. Now that doesn't mean it has an issue, but 99 out of 100 times, it's going to have either compromised shift points or uh, judders in between shifts or while maintaining speed and things along with those nature. So uh, we don't do too many transmission replacements, although I'm kind of opposed to the torque converter replacement solely because typically when it throws that code, and we have, um, you know, a, a you know, higher mileage car just replacing a torque converter, in my opinion, is a Band-Aid. I think Honda should be replacing the transmissions on these, but obviously that's not my call to make, but that's what I think happens. And oftentimes we'll do the torque converter and a car will come back with some other issue or, you know, you know, it'll drive better, but not perfect. So if you have one of these transmissions, uh, I would highly recommend 15 to 20,000 mile intervals. Now, I know that sounds excessive, but uh, you know, the proof is in the pudding. When I do these 16, 20,000 miles, my customers never have any issues, including a uh, juddering and torque converter failures uh, down the line. Now, when these are neglected, they will drive absolutely horrible. Now, in comparison to the spent two, uh, 10 speed transmission found in many of the newer Honda vehicles, it's such a much better transmission. It holds extreme amount of power and torque as proven by the uh, performance guys on the uh, Accords with the 10 speeds as well as the TLX uh, Type S guys. Now, the torque converter, uh, uh, excuse me, the transfer case issue stripping is a different issue from the actual transmission being the strong or not. That's a separately different issue. Uh, that is something that I do have a problem with these transmissions. Although in a pilot and your average uh, Joe car, you're probably going to be okay. Now they do use the same type of transfer cases in many of the vehicles. So we'll see how that has to play out in the long term on you know your average everyday consumer. Now I did find one already on RDX uh, and the MDX base models. 
uh, with a strip transfer cases slash transmission. So we'll see how it goes. But as far as drivability goes, I also think it has uh, too, too many gears. I think an eight speed option would have been way better. A lot of times the transmission seems like doesn't really know what it wants to do. You know, you might be accelerating, all of a sudden you start decelerating and it upshifts versus downshifting. So I just think that less gears would have been better here. And I covered this on a, a previous uh, Q&A a couple weeks back. And I think the eight speed transmission probably would have been ideal here, but Honda chose to do a 10 speed. So here we are. I would still take the 10 speed transmission any day over the six speed, in my opinion, especially if you do not want to maintain it every 15 to 20,000 miles doing a transmission service. On these, you could probably push it to 45, 60,000 miles. I'm still going to do and recommend every 30,000. If you have your car modified at that point, that changes everything. And I would highly recommend doing it every 15 to 20,000 miles on either of those transmissions as well. Um, but again, if I had to choose one, a 10 speed all day, we don't see that many issues with them. Uh, we see some concerns and you guys even ask a lot of them, you know, with the drivability and stuff like that. So it can get weird at times. I think software updates could correct that. So if you have an issue going on, voice it to your local Honda dealer. Doesn't mean they're going to be able to do anything but it'll be noted and that's when it prompts everything for Honda and Acura to kind of start looking into it. And it might just be something as simple as a software update that could correct that, you know, jerkiness, shifting and stuff like that. So please uh, voice your concern. Chances are your service technician won't have an answer for you, won't have an update. Uh, as you feel, uh, if it's been 60, 70,000 miles, there's a good chance that the few, uh, fluid uh, quality could be compromised and a trans service could certainly make it better but may not you know, resolve the issue 100%. So hopefully that answers the question for okay, you. So the next question is rotor set screws, uh, tips on getting them off. So uh, a couple of you guys asked this question already a couple of different times. And recently I was following a Honda Tech buddy uh, out in California, and he literally takes a three, number three screwdriver to it and twists it out by hands. Now, he's in California, there's little to no rust. Here in Jersey, that is never going to happen 99 out of 100 times. Usually what I like to do is take an impact driver and hit it with a hammer and twist it off. I have an example uh, of one in the, the video somewhere. If all else fails, I uh, sometimes I can take a torch to it, a little propane torch, just heat it up a little bit or give it some hard smacks with uh, two hammers, a flat side of the hammer on a, a ball pin side and then hit it with another hammer and then uh, get it out that way. If all that fails, uh, I take a punch to it with a hammer and try to drive it out. And if all that fails, then it's probably just going to snap on you. And then at that point, you could either get more time for the customer or if you're doing it yourself to drill it out. So it's going to be a six by one thread screw and then put a new one in. Uh, if the customer doesn't want to do that, it'll be fine. Uh, I like to put them back if available. So a lot of new cars use just one. Back in the days, it was a two screws down. Most of them are just one. And one is fine. Again, it's just here to hold, uh, you know, the rotor on. And just to keep uh, rust from getting behind it every time you take out and put the wheel back. Not such a big deal in an anti-rust state. But anywhere above the rust belt, it's certainly going to be an issue. So uh, impact driver, some heat, uh, you know, and a uh, punch and drive it out with that punch and a hammer. If all else fails, it's probably gonna break on you and you could drill it or just have the option of not putting it back. So hopefully that answers the question for you. EGR valves, what does it do? Uh, does it require maintenance? And are there some common failures? So EGR valve, all it does is take exhaust gases and put them back into the intake to reduce nitrogen oxide or known as a NOx. So in the earlier days, they would use this a lot. Now it's done with uh, valve timing, cam profiles and stuff like that. VTC uh, has a lot to do with this. That's why on most of the new engines, you will no longer see EGR valves and it's something kind of a thing of the past. Now, as far as common failures, three different things uh, back in the days in the early 90s and the late, uh, late 90s, early 2000s and all that decade basically, um, Honda had a lot of carbon issues which would come in the form of a code, insufficient flow. So you would get that code and the ports would all be clogged up. There's a couple bulletins, we had to drill, we had to put sleeves and things of that nature. Uh, typically on the four cylinders and the V6 is more or so on the J series V6. So uh, other issues that we see, so that would be just for insufficient flow because it is carboned up. Now other issues we see are for uh, valve lift, uh, which is just not lifting as much as it needs to or not opening as much as need to. And 
Oftentimes, after cleaning these jobs, cars will come back with a high idle, so a piece of carbon will lose somewhere, and now it got jammed in the valve and causing a high idle and all sorts of wacky stuff. So uh, typically, these valves do not go bad. Uh, so those are some common issues, but again, as of the last maybe decade or two, they really haven't been an issue. Once in a while, we'll replace them for range performances and stuff like that, but not something that we see on a uh, common or daily or even a weekly uh, basis. So if you have a car that has a valve, I would personally just leave it alone. There's no set uh, you know, mileage or time or year they need to go ahead and replace this valve um, or anything like that. You also don't need to uh, take it out and clean it. Now, surely you could go ahead and do it. If you do take it out, usually uh, it's a good idea to replace that gasket. You're going to have to buy it. Usually it'll come with a new valve, but if you take it out, it'll get all damaged and you wanna go ahead and replace that. It's just so you don't have any uh, leaks causing any uh, wacky stuff or anything along the line. Now, personally, again, I don't recommend them. I don't recommend cleaning them at all. Uh, not something that we see an issue with as of late. So, uh, you know, sometimes it's just better to let it be than go, go ahead to mess with it and cause, uh, again, some loose carbon to get stuck in there and causing you some drivability issues. So hopefully it answers the question. So the next question is, will Honda pay for a warranty alignment on a new car? Now this question was brought up because they say the car had a very, very slight drift uh, to one way or the other. I don't remember the specifics, but uh, usually, um, you know, those drifts are from like simple stuff like tire pressure or the actual road you are driving on. Now, people often say, well, the car drifts left and right. Well, if the alignment is off, it's not going to do both of them. So it's gonna go either one way or another way. So typically it's either the road and typical for the road crowning. So the road is designed to where it drains to one side or the other or both. Now, obviously it's not something that we see, it's something very slight, you know, maybe a five, 10 degree pitch. Uh, maybe somebody out there has the actual uh, you know, numbers, but it is designed so the water doesn't pull up in the middle and goes out to uh, one or both ways. So uh, typically, if you do have an issue, yes, we'll go ahead and put it on a line rack. And the warranty procedure is kind of annoying. There's a lot of paperwork involved, but yes, of course, if you have an issue, we're gonna check it. Uh, now, if you continue to have an issue, we'll compare it to another vehicle. Sometimes we'll swap out tires. Now, oftentimes these uh, issues are from a car sitting out in a lot. Maybe the tires got a little bit of a flat spot, just causing some wacky drivability stuff. Can the alignment be off from factory? Absolutely. Is it probable? Uh, probably not. So it can happen. Chances are that's not your issue. It's the road or roads you are driving on or just something weird that you are experiencing. Now, typical rule of thumb is if the car drives straight for six seconds, then it is good. Now, if you're you know, release the steering wheel and you hit a pothole or a bump and that naturally is going to make the car go one way or another. So that test is void. So you have to be a perfectly even road. If you're on a highway, like a three lane highway, I would try to, you know, do this test on the center lane there. So it's not a uh, pitch one way or the other as much as possible to make your test uh, as credible as possible. And again, test drive with another vehicle. Uh, sometimes we'll swap out wheels from another vehicle just to make sure it's not the tires. Now tire could be imperfected and you know, anything can happen. But uh, yes, we will do a warranty alignment if needed uh, just to answer your questions. But chances are it is something else and not the actual alignment. So hopefully that answers the question for you. All right, and last but not least, question of the week. And once again, if you want a chance of any questions being answered, please drop a comment down below and I will try to get to each and every one of these questions. So the question is, this person was removing their spark plugs, the porcelain cracked. So I'm gonna say right off the bat with these new thinner style spark plugs found on all these new engines with the 14 millimeter socket, do not, do not, do not use an impact tool to install them or remove them. These things crack so easy, it is uh, unbelievable. Even with the rubber sometimes, if the rubber's a little bit worn out, it will crack. Now. I take the rubber out of mine because oftentimes the socket will get stuck on there. So when removing these or installing them, please, when you put them back, torque them. Uh, and when you're removing them and you're breaking it loose, try to keep that ratchet as straight as possible. The minute it twists a little bit, the chances are you're going to crack that porcelain and you will hear it. So you have to pay attention and you will hear it. Now, the question is, this got, uh, he, this person actually cracked one of them and the porcelain fell inside the cylinder. So number one thing you wanna do is stop right there. Don't do anything else. Look at the spark plug and see how much of that porcelain is missing. Usually it's about a couple of millimeters and chances are 99 out of 100 times it fell inside the cylinder. So you're gonna to wanna to take a bore scope, 
and find the porcelain. If it fell in the cylinder, you're going to see it. Now, if it is in there, you're going to have to decide, what am I going to do? What I usually like to do is take the end of a zip tie, so not the tip, the one that it goes through, so the bigger part of the zip tie, and put some bearing grease on there, some silicone paste, something real tacky and sticky. Now, I'm going to go ahead, put it down in there, and you know, fish around in it until I grab it, pull it out. Make sure I grab all of it. If you can't grab all of it at that point, uh, you're in some deep trouble here. Uh, hopefully, it's something that could come out and you identify and pick up all the pieces before you can put everything safely back together. If you cannot uh, take it out that way, uh, you could try one of those claws, but typically the hole is too small to where you could get it. And it's going to be hard to fish out of here because you're going to be kind of blind. So uh, I think uh, the grease on the end of a zip tie works great. Uh, you can't use a magnet, it's not magnetic, so that's not gonna work either. So uh, just please do not try to start the car with the spark, with the porcelain in there. You could, you know, bring the piston all the way up slowly by hand, get it, you know, 90% of the way up, so you have less of an area to fish down in there and try to get it out that way. Uh, at that point, you're also going to have, uh, depending on the stroke, so you wanna be top dead center on that cylinder, the valve's closed. At that point, you could probably try to use some compressed air and try to you know, blow it out until you can get it out. Uh, but again, you're playing with fire. Uh, the best thing to do here is take some sort of a, you know, maybe dum-dum or some grease, end of a zip tie or a coat hanger or whatever you want to do and try to get it out that way. Uh, hopefully that works out for you. Uh, it's happened a couple of times to the guys. I tried to drill this into their head, stop using impact tools, especially to remove them. Most of them are good about putting them by hand, but uh, the vibration for the impact tool uh, definitely takes a toll on these spark plugs. And we see a lot of them after being installed, the new ones crack sometimes too. I mean, they crack so easy, it's ridiculous. So uh, don't use the magnetic sockets. Use the ones with the rubber uh, insert and definitely not the ones with the metal insert. Uh, that seems to work the best. Again, I don't do it, but I know this is a thing. Uh, I don't crack them. Uh, I mean, can it happen? Sure, but I don't crack them. The uh, minute I hear anything, I pull the socket back out, and if I see something there, then I will you know, address it accordingly. If I see that a piece has fallen, I will tie the plug back up. Usually it happens right at crack, and I'll try to blow it out or suck it out with a vacuum uh, that way just to avoid anything falling inside the cylinder. So hopefully that tip helps you out and I'll catch everyone on the next one.